Thank you guys. So I'm Johanna Asquith. I'm a second year ID fellow at USF. So um, I picked this topic, obviously, um, as those in the room know, I have a seven month old baby that is currently being breastfed. So this is very close to my heart right now. Um, but I think I've encountered some questions this year that um, would make this relevant for everybody else too. So I've got some things mixed in. So I hope you guys enjoy it. So we'll get started. So First thing, our objectives, so we're going to talk about the current recommendations on breastfeeding, um, breastfeeding challenges, uh, some proper pumping techniques, uh, breast milk microbiome, we'll talk about transmissible infections, donor breast milk, um, and of course I don't have any disclosures and no conflicts of interest. So, First thing, uh, the current recommendations, so the American Academy of Pediatrics and the WHO both have recommendations. and. Both say to exclusively breastfeed for the first six months is recommended. Um, American Academy of Pediatrics <coughs> says up to a, a year or longer um, and add um, solid foods in at six months. Um, WHO says up to two years or longer. Um, so a little bit about some colostrum and breast milk. So colostrum provides all the nutrients that a newborn baby needs. Um, compared with the more mature milk, it has a higher protein level, um, slightly lower in sugar, and significantly lower in fat. Um, the more mature milk, it has virtually all the um, elements that a baby needs, um, has protein, sugar, fat, um, as well as antibodies. Um, if you are breastfeeding, you do have to supplement with vitamin D, so that's the one thing they would be lacking. Um, breast milk contains antibodies, as we all know, immune factors, enzymes um, that protect the baby against a wide variety of diseases, um, which you don't get with formula. All right, so the breastfeeding baby. So benefits for baby. Um, it's obviously perfectly balanced nutrition for the baby. It's easy to digest. Um, there's a lower risk of infections, um, chronic diseases, allergies, obesity, leukemia, uh, lower incidence of SIDS, um, lower incidence, incidence of sepsis and uh, necrotizing intercolitis in preterm infants. Um, and it's actually recommended for all preterm infants um, less than 1.5 kilograms to receive human milk. Um, whether that's their own mother or donor um, breast milk, um, and the added benefits of improved neurodevelopment. So um, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a milk policy statement, as you can see up there. Um, they actually have the incidence per each kind of infection and how much of a reduced risk you have depending on how much you're breastfeeding. So in some incidents, just any breastfeeding at all, um, like for otitis media, can reduce your risk by about 25%. Um, if you breastfeed for three to six months, 50%, um, longer than six months, um, you reduce the risk for baby having otitis media um, by 75%. And that's true with upper respiratory tract infections, asthma, RSV, and neck as well. Um, some additional benefits. So breastfed babies have lower incidence of atopic dermatitis, um, gastrointestinal, diseases, um, celiac disease, obesity, diabetes, leukemia, and SIDS. Okay. Um, so why breastfeed? How about the benefits for mom, right? <laughs> what about me? <laughs> um, so a lot of things are decreased. So um, decreased postpartum blood loss. Um, the uterus involutes a lot quicker if you're breastfeeding. Um, a lower incidence of postpartum depression, which is a pretty big deal. Um, lower incidence of type 2 diabetes, um, except for in mothers that already have gestational diabetes. Um, there's a lower risk for rheumatoid arthritis, um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and uh, coronary artery disease. Um, the incidence of breast and ovarian cancer are actually reduced by a pretty significant amount. I mean, 28% if you breastfeed for a year, and then for each additional year that you breastfeed, the risk goes down even further um, by an additional 4% each year, so pretty big. Um, delayed menses and natural contraception if you're exclusively breastfeeding, um, and then a faster return to pre-pregnancy weight, supposedly. <laughs> so all those benefits aside, there, what are the common reasons for people to actually stop breastfeeding? So biggest one, lactation and latching problems. Um, breastfeeding is supposed to be natural, it's supposed to be easy, and I will tell you that it is not, and it takes a lot of people um, showing you how to do the right thing and take some practice. So um, there's a lot of sore and, and achy nipples in the beginning. So 
that's a common reason why people quit breastfeeding. Um, cultural norms um, and lack of family support is another. Um, unsupportive hospital practices or policies. Um, we work at a hospital that really supports breastfeeding, so there's lactation nurses available. They don't give breastfeeding babies pacifiers. They don't um, give them formula if they're breastfeeding, so there's a lot of procedures in place that really um, try to support breastfeeding if that's what you're trying to do. Um, and some hospitals aren't like that. Um, people stop feeding or stop breastfeeding if there's concern about infant nutrition or weight concerns. Um, a lot of people, you can't see how much your uh, milk you're providing when you're breastfeeding. So it's not as easy as when you're formula feeding. You can say exactly your baby got two ounces or whatever. You don't really know how much they're getting. And if they're not gaining weight quickly enough, you're not sure if they're getting enough milk. So sometimes people will stop breastfeeding for that reason. Um, if a mom is on a medication that's contraindicated, that would be another reason. Unsupportive work policies, so you know, lack of maternity leave um, and that sort of thing, uh, and lack of parental leave as well. Um, epidemiology of breastfeeding. So um, there's been a lot of studies. These, this is from the CDC um, to look at you know who's more likely to breastfeed and not. And what they found is um, fewer non-Hispanic black infants are ever breastfed um, compared to non-Hispanic white infants and Hispanic infants. Um, socioeconomic factors play a part as well. They found that um, people that were actually eligible and receiving WIC um, breastfed less than people who were either eligible and not taking it or ineligible. Um, and then age as well. So younger mothers um, ages 20 to 29 were actually less likely to breastfeed as well um, than older mothers. It also varies by state. So this is from the CDC as well. You can see that the um, levels in the Northeast and the Northwest are higher than the rest of the country. I don't know why, but that's, that's the pattern that they found, so. All right, um, so because of all these good things that come from breastfeeding, um, the CDC um, has a spot in its Healthy People 2020 to talk about maternal um, care and breastfeeding. Um, and basically just provides a 10-year look um, on how to improve breastfeeding. So their mission is just to improve this world or improve this nationwide. Um, there's 12 targeted areas, um, and one of them, like I said, is maternal and child health. So let's look at those. So for breastfeeding in particular, they want to increase the proportion of infants who are ever breastfed. Um, currently, the target um, is 80, or sorry, the target's 81%, and we're exceeding it at 83%. Um, they want to increase the proportion of infants who are breastfed at six months. Um, you can see that the numbers significantly drop off, um, you know, by 30%. Uh, people who are actually still breastfeeding at six months and then drop off even more at one year. All right. Um, they want to increase the proportion of um, infants who are exclusively breastfed as well. So that previous table was just any breastfeeding and maybe breastfeeding along with formula feeding. This is exclusively breastfeeding. So you can see the rates are even less um, for people who are exclusively breastfeeding. And then they want to increase the proportion of employers that have worksite lactation support programs um, as well. Um, reduce the proportion of breastfed newborns who receive formula um, within the first couple of days of life um, and increase the number of uh, live births that, or sorry, uh, facilities that provide uh, care for lactating mothers, sorry. Um, so how's Florida doing? Um, you can see we're pretty on par with the national average except for in a couple of instances. Um, in Florida, there's more people who are giving formula before the first two days of life. Um, and that's, you know, one of the big areas that we can target, so, all right. So we kind of talked about this, how hospitals um, can support breastfeeding. So basically all hospitals should have a written breastfeeding policy and they should be training their staff on how to implement that. Um, educate pregnant women um, on the benefits of breastfeeding and how to manage it. Um, they should help mothers initiate breastfeeding within the first hour of life. Um, they found that that's very important to start the, the breastfeeding relationship. Encouraging skin-to-skin -skin contact um, is a big deal. Um, they put the baby right on you as soon as you have a baby now, which is very different from the way it used to be. Um, show mothers how to breastfeed and then how to maintain um, if they're separated from their infants. So teaching you how to um, latch the baby, teaching you how to pump and all those things. Um, encouraging breastfeeding on demand, so um, 
used to, they would say you breastfeed the baby every couple of hours and have the baby on a schedule and really they've gotten away from that. It's more if the baby's crying and wants to eat, then go ahead and feed them. So, um, and not giving uh, babies any other food or drink other than breast milk, um, unless it's medically indicated. Um, not giving any nipples or pacifiers to breastfeeding infants as well. Um, practice rooming in. Um, used to when we were born, you know, our parents would have us and we would go to the nursery and they would just come get us. And now, as soon as you have the baby, they put the baby in your room and guess what? You're my mom or dad. So, yeah. All right. Um, and then providing lactation support too. So, all right. So, all that said, you've decided to breastfeed. So, there's so many things to know. So, let's go over some of this. All right. All right. First thing, babies eat a lot. <laughs> And all the time. <laughs> um, so <laughs> a typical newborn schedule, um, you can see to the left. So they eat a couple of ounces every couple of hours. And if you can imagine, you're, I mean, I thought residency and fellowship kind of, you know, prepared me for being a parent. <laughs> and I had no idea the amount of sleep deprivation that kids um, can bring on. So yeah, it's, it's, it can be a challenge. Um, and there you go. So this is uh, kind of every couple of hours you're doing something, whether feeding them or changing them or something. So, yeah. All right. Now, decided to breastfeed. You also need a breast pump. This is just a few of the ones that are on the market. This is what's actually available to us through our, um, health, uh, our health insurance at Tampa General. So um, the ones on the left, I've use personally the ones on the right or some other ones I don't know much about but as you can see they're a wide variety and you may have you know one reason or another to pick different ones so all right and you may think that you know feeding them a lot they're eating every couple of hours well you also should be pumping in between that time too to kind of help establish them, your milk production so you're not just done after you feed them so you want to go from the picture on the left to something more like the picture on the right. <laughs> if you're doing it right. All right. Um, the picture in the middle is kind of a, a theme of how you can power pump. So everybody produces milk differently. Some people produce very little. Some people overproduce. Um, and if you're having trouble, then they recommend doing something called power pumping, where you're literally pumping for 20 minutes, giving yourself a break for 10 minutes, pumping. Like, yeah, you, you get the idea. It's, it's a lot. Um, and you're doing this multiple times a day to, to get the milk production up. So it can be, can be daunting. All right. Um, so here you go. A day in the life of uh, the breastfeeding mom. So <laughs> it's a wonderful, beautiful thing, I swear. Um, you should all have kids. Um, <laughs> this is how I felt when I came back to work. <laughs> You know, you've got your purse, you've got a bag with your pump in it, you've got another bag that has all your milk stuff in it. You, you, you feel like you're, you're bringing a whole case to work, for sure. Um, and this is kind of my typical schedule, actually, um, just so you guys have an idea. Feed the baby before I go to work in the morning. Um, about 10 or 11, pump again. 1 o'clock, pump again. 3 o'clock, pump again. 5 o'clock, feed them when I get home. Feed them again, and then feed them again. <laughs> And I, I found this on the internet. This is pretty, pretty typical, I think, so. All right, so, you know, that being said, you gotta learn to be efficient and, you know, you need to get a little creative. So, you know, my solution was pumping in the car um, on the way to work, on the way to the different hospital sites, everywhere else. Um, you may have to find somewhere to pump <laughs> at work. <laughs> Um, there should be lactation rooms, but you know, not everywhere is up to date on that. So that being considered, and you know, you might find yourself pumping at your desk. <laughs> All right. And don't forget. So, you know, you may think it's been a lot already. You've, you know, you've pumped, you've fed. Well, now you've got to clean everything. Um, and that's a lot. And then you, you know, feed and pump and clean and repeat. Um, and kind of feel like it's Groundhog Day, right? So not to bore you guys too much, but there's a lot on the CDC about how to clean your pump. And I'm only going through this just because, honestly, it's important. Um, not all moms know what they're supposed to do with the pump. It's a lot of 
things to kind of thrust at you. You're trying to take care of a newborn and then you've got all these other responsibilities too. Um, and there have been a lot of case reports of some, some unhappy events from pumps and breast milk. So um, obviously we all know hand hygiene is essential. So wash your hands, assemble everything, make sure everything's clean, wipe everything down, especially if you're sharing um, a pump with you know other people, which really would, I know. If you're in the hospital though, those things are multi-use, so you know you've got to make sure that it's it's being cleaned. So um, after every use, you're going to store the milk safely. You're going to clean the pumping area, take everything apart, rinse everything, clean all the parts. You can put them in the dishwasher. They tell you to use a basin, a single basin, to wash everything with soap and water, and you're supposed to use soap and water to wash it after every pumping session. You're not supposed to put anything in the sink to sit. Um, and you're not supposed to basically leave the milk on the, the parts at all. So if you can imagine, you're, you're doing a lot of cleaning. Um, then you're supposed to dry everything thoroughly. You're not supposed to put anything away wet because obviously that causes bacterial contamination too. So, all right. Um, and if you want to go the extra step, which I do, of course, um, is sanitize everything as well. So I have a sterilizer that I put everything in. All right. Just for example, this is the breast pump that I have, and you can see these are all the pump parts on the on the right side. So every use, there's about a dozen parts. And so, and that's a dozen parts that need to be cleaned after every time. Yes. So, but it's still worth it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Promise. <laughs> all right. So, like I mentioned, um, shortcuts may be tempting. Obviously, you're exhausted, and you're feeding a child, and you're cleaning everything, um, but don't do it. Um, there have been case reports of babies having sepsis from mom's milk. Um, this particular one, um, they the baby had MRSA. There was another one that had Pseudomonas, um, and it was all traced back to a sold uh, pump that the mom was using. So um, another one was Acinetobacter in a NICU. That was because of multi-use pumps um, that weren't being properly cleaned. Um, another one. Um, this comes from uh, the recommendations of not allowing your pump parts to sit in a basin. Um, this baby had a chronobacter from it sitting in the sink. They traced it back to the sink at the child's home. So, yeah. So, saying all that, um, so breast milk storage stuff. So, use breast milk storage bags, clean food grade containers, um, avoid bottles that have the recycle number seven on it, which means it contains BPA. Um, and never store breast milk in disposable bottles or bags. Um, I actually found this picture online, which you can see is someone has their breast milk in a water bottle, and those were actually for sale. So um, that's highly uh, discouraged, so don't do that. Um, there's a lot of storage guidelines as well. So a lot of things um, go into breast milk. So you have to know if it's, if it's fresh breast milk. Um, it can sit out at room temperature um, up to four hours. If it's older than that, it needs to be discarded. Um, you can put breast milk in the refrigerator for, this is three days, I've seen up to five days, um, or you can deep freeze it for up to six months. Um, once you thought, you've only got an hour or two to use it, and then it's bad. So you've got to be careful with um, thawing things out and and freezing. Um, obviously label everything, use the oldest milk first, um, don't store it in the door of the refrigerator because obviously there's too much variation in temperature there. Um, freeze breast milk in small amounts, you don't want to be wasting it. Um, thaw it in the refrigerator overnight or you can thaw it in a warm container, but whatever's thawed you must use or you need to throw it away. Um, obviously never use the microwave to heat um, breast milk or any kind of milk because um, it can have heat spots. Uh, use breast milk within 24 hours of thawing in the refrigerator. Um, once it's brought to room temperature, like I said, uh, use it within two hours and then never refreeze it once it's been thawed. All right, so saying all that, is breast milk sterile? You would think that it is, right? I mean, why, why wouldn't it be? But no, it's not. Um, there's a lot, a lot of articles out there about breast milk microbiome. I just picked a few just that I thought were interesting. Um, there's lots of different techniques that are out there. Some have used PCR to see what kind of bacteria are there. Some have used culture, so I think that's why there's so many different results. Um, 
And then bacteria vary. I mean, we know this. Like, you go from hospital to hospital, you see higher incidences <laughs> of some bacteria in one hospital than another, and you can see this in all these studies as well. So this one I thought was interesting. So this is a study of Chinese mothers, and they're looking at um, three cities in China. Um, it was conducted between 2011 and 2012, and they use a 16S um, RNA PCR um, to look at all the bacteria. Um, in there, and they looked at aseptic techniques as well as um, non-aseptic techniques um, to see if the bacteria varied. Um, in the inclusion criteria, they looked at women between 18 and 45 um, that gave birth to a single healthy baby and that were exclusively breastfeeding. Um, exclusion criteria were gestational diabetes, hypertension, cardiac disease, um, as well as hormonal therapy and antibiotic treatment. All right. Um, so the procedure, they did 30 collections um, from aseptic protocol, and that for them was sterile gloves. They discarded the first few drops, and then the breast was thoroughly cleansed with chlorhexidine solution before it was collected. Um, and then 60 samples were collected from a different group of mothers that just used standard protocol, and they really didn't have any guidelines um, on the proper cleaning technique for those. Um, breast milk was sampled in different quantities, depending on if it was uh, colostrum or not. Um, the samples were frozen and then shipped to Switzerland um, for DNA extraction. Um, all right, so here's the results. Um, that top one is the, the standard technique, so those were not collected aseptically, and then the bottom is aseptically. And you can see, I mean, there's a wide, wide variation um, in bacteria uh, depending on how it was collected and whatnot. Um, you see a lot of skin flora, a lot of strep and staph, um, as well as what I thought was interesting was there was a high percentage of Acinetobacter um, in the ones that were collected without aseptic technique. All right. Um, what they also noticed was that aseptic technique um, had a log less bacteria um, than the ones that were collected with standard protocol too. All right another study that I found. Um, I picked this one because this one was actually done. Um, one of the centers was in St. Pete. Um, so they were looking at breast milk and establishment of uh, the infant gut microbiome. All right, so they wanted to, to look and see what bacteria um, were present in breast milk and the skin around the areola and in the infant gut. Um, and like I said, they did at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles as well as All Children's Hospital in St. Pete. Um, and that was from 2010 to 2015. Um, they looked at 107 babies and moms. And what they found, um, sorry, um, what I thought was interesting too is that uh, you can see the race and ethnicity in this study. There was a lot of uh, Hispanic uh, population in this study, um, which I thought was interesting. And here's what they found. Uh, they found a, a lot, much <coughs> larger correlation between the breast milk and the areola skin than the stool. Um, they found that a baby's flora was more closely related to its mom versus another mom, which is not a big surprise there. Um, and then they found, um, sorry, uh, oh, sorry. Um, they also looked at what happened after solids were introduced, and they found that there was a dose-dependent measure for that as well. So that's what's shown here. Um, you can see that in this study in particular, they actually had less strep and staph and actually more Pseudomonas and Enterobacter. Um, so yeah, it definitely varies widely depending on geography. And then you can see how the stool changed, uh, the flora changed as well as solids were added. Okay. Now, I told you there's a lot of, of uh, information out there. So some other things I found, um, global variation, obviously. Um, there's studies out there that look at the delivery methods. So vaginal delivery versus cesarean delivery um, to see if that changes the microbiome. Um, maternal health and diet. Course. Um, one study found that moms um, getting uh, a probiotic actually found that in the breast milk, um, even after treatment. Uh, milk from obese mothers had more bacteria, but it had less diversity than 
um, mothers that were not obese. Um, antibiotic use during pregnancy um, actually increased the overall bacterial count, but it decreased its diversity. Um, and then chemotherapy um, was also looked at, and they saw um, an increased amount of Acinetobacter um, and Sinotrophomonas. So, all right. All right, so that said, we always hear breast is best, so is it always? So we're gonna talk about some of the transmissible infections, and I think this is where um, you know, we may come into play, you know, someone may ask if it's okay to breastfeed, you know, if they've got these certain conditions. So first one we'll talk about is mastitis. Um, obviously it can be caused by milk stasis or a bacterial infection. It affects about 25% of lactating women. Um, usually if it's bacterial, it can be unilateral um, and kind of wedge shape, but honestly, any kind of mastitis can look like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be from bacterial infection. Um, risk factors, obviously broken skin um, is huge um, or an oversupply of milk. Primary treatment is just to reverse milk stasis. So to keep breastfeeding or pumping um, to get the milk out of the ducts. Um, analgesics and antibiotics may be needed at some, sometimes. All right, um, breast abscess is the most common complication of mastitis, all right. Um, next one is flu. Um, this actually happened to me this year when my baby was five months old. <laughs> so I, I was like, what do I do? Do I feed her? Do I not feed her? What am I supposed to do? So um, is it safe to feed um, a baby if you have the flu? And yes, it actually is. Um, obviously, the flu is not transmitted through the breast milk, um, but baby gets antibodies from the breast milk, and it can actually help them um, get over the infection, too, if they have it. Um, and it they recommend if mom's too sick um, to breastfeed that they actually pump and give the express milk anyway. Um, how can a mom protect her baby from getting sick? Obviously, um, good hand hygiene and then um, vaccination, of course, if the baby's older than six months. All right. Um, so uh, obviously there's antivirals um, that we give for flu. Are you able to give that when someone's breastfeeding? Answer to that is yes. Um, so um, they consider a postpartum period um, to be within two weeks after birth. Um, so if a woman comes in with flu-like symptoms, you should be treating her. Um, and Tamiflu is the recommended because um, that's been the most studied. All right. How about traveler's diarrhea? <laughs> Is it safe to feed your baby when you have traveler's diarrhea? Yes. Um, obviously, those organisms are not going to pass through breast milk. Obviously, you need to be washing your hands, though. Um, and they actually say a nursing mom with diarrhea, if it's caused by a food or water illness, they need to increase their fluid intake, um, but then also increase breastfeeding as well. Um, and just to note, exclusive breastfeeding infants actually have um, protection against those sort of things and they encourage you to continue breastfeeding and not to give them any other sort of supplementation if mom's experiencing traveler's diarrhea. <clears throat> um, Over-the-counter antidiarrheal agents um, can be okay unless they have bismuth. Um, that one actually goes into the breast milk so that should be avoided. Um, fluoroquinolones and macrolides are excreted in breast milk as well um, but usually like azithromycin is considered safe. Okay, all right, how about HSV? Is it safe for moms with HSV to breastfeed? No. Not if your nipple looks like that. <laughs> all right, if, if they have HSV and they have their lesions covered up and they don't have lesions on that breast, they're okay to breastfeed. Um, or they can um, feed the baby express breast milk. If they do have lesions, they should not be feeding the baby express milk or breastfeeding from that side. All right, until those lesions are cleared up. Okay. All right, and just a side note, if they're not breastfeeding, they need to be pumping or doing something if they're trying to continue breastfeeding, that way they don't lose their milk supply. Okay. All right, what about varicella? Should a mom with varicella breastfeed? All right. So moms who develop varicella within five days before through two days after delivery should actually be separated from their infants. Um, but their express milk can actually be used for feeding. All right, CMV. Is it safe to breastfeed if you have CMV? 
Yes. All right. There's no contraindication of breastfeeding a full-term infant. Caveat to that is if they're extremely premature, you may not want to feed them, but you've got to weigh the risks and benefits. Um, there is possibility that CMV acquired um, from mom's milk can be associated with late onset sepsis um, in very low birth weight infants, um, but there's no long-term side effects that they've seen from that, so. All right. Um, they actually say that the benefit of human milk actually outweighs um, the risk of CMV transmission because it protects the infant against uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. So, all right. Freezing of the milk reduces but does not eliminate CMV. Um, holder pasteurization or high temperature will eliminate it, but it also affects some of the nutrients. So they actually say fresh mom's milk is preferable um, to routinely feed preterm infants, even in this situation. All right, hepatitis B. What do you guys think? Is it safe to breastfeed or not? I see a lot of no's in the room. It depends. It depends. So, no, it's actually if, um, so babies are going to get um, immunized immediately after birth. So, um, as long as they get that, there's no need to delay breastfeeding until they're fully immunized. Um, and the risk of HPV mother to child transmission through breastfeeding is really negligible. Um, the only caveat to that is if their nipples are cracked and bleeding, you may want to avoid it until their nipples heal up. So, um, hepatitis C, what do you guys think? Safe? safe. It is safe. There's no documented evidence that breastfeeding spreads hepatitis C. All right. Again, back to the, the cracked or bleeding nipples. So data is kind of insufficient, but they do say if you do have cracked or bleeding nipples and you have hepatitis B or C, probably should avoid breastfeeding for a little while until those are healed. All right, HIV. So I had this situation this year where a mom came in with AIDS, was being treated before, um, before birth, and she wanted to breastfeed. So. What do you guys think? Is that okay or not? A lot of no's in the room. Absolutely. Um, so it is definitely recommended by the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics if an HIV-infected mom um, has access to clean water, essentially, um, and formula, they should absolutely not breastfeed. Um, doesn't matter what their viral load is um, or if they're on ART. Um, however, if they're in resource limited settings like some places in Africa around the world um, they actually recommend the same that they do for everyone else um, by the WHO basically exclusive breast meeting for exclusive breastfeeding for six months and then carried on for a year as long with their ART so all right toxoplasmosis is it safe to feed with toxoplasmosis <laughs> it is so there's <laughs> there's no documented cases of transmission through breast milk. Um, however, there's a theoretical risk because it does circulate in blood. Um, and if you had cracked or bleeding nipples, theoretically you could pass it on to the baby, but there's no, no indication to not breastfeed. All right, about West Nile virus. Safe, so. Interesting though, there have been a few documented cases of infants getting uh, West Nile virus um, from their mother, but they, they still did not recommend not breastfeeding. All right, Ebola. False, False absolutely. Um, breast milk can contain <laughs> Ebola, should be avoided if any safe alternative exists. All right, HTLV one or two. False. Yes, they should avoid breastfeeding if they have HTLV one or two. All right. TB. <laughs> Safe or not? All right, so it depends. So moms should temporarily stop um, breastfeeding if they have active untreated TB. Um, they can feed the express breast milk, but they should not be directly breastfeeding. So. Um, mothers can resume breastfeeding if TB has been treated for a minimum of two weeks and they're not considered contagious any longer. All right. 
Brucella. <laughs> Everybody's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's not. Um, if it's untreated brucella, they should avoid breastfeeding and should not feed the express breast milk either. Okay. <coughs> All of our favorites, dengue, zika, chikungunya, yellow fever. Safe. It is safe. Even though these viruses have been recovered in breast milk, it's still considered safe. All right. So a little summary. So caution with breastfeeding if someone has active um, HSV lesions on their nipples, um, they should not be feeding. If they have cracked or bleeding nipples with hepatitis B or C, they should not be breastfeeding. Um, untreated TB, active varicella, um, safe in these others, and avoid breastfeeding entirely. Um, if they have HIV, Ebola, HTLV1, or untreated, one or two, or brucella, that's untreated. All right. So, you've been pumping and pumping and you're not making much milk. What now? There are donor human milk banks, all right? And American Academy of Pediatrics um, published this in 2017 um, on the, the usage of donor milk and they actually recommended it especially for high-risk preterm infants, so. What does that mean? So, donor human milk. So. Um, these should be considered for infants that are weighing less than 1,500 grams or if maternal milk is insufficient. Um, it's actually pasteurized and it's safe um, when appropriate measures have been taken and they actually screen donors, they collect it, they store it, pasteurize it, and then distribute it. Um, for the U.S., the Human Milk Banking Association of North America um, is the primary source. There's 24 of these um, currently in the U.S. Um, they do the screening with the health screen, they do serologic testing, um, and they give moms instructions on how to collect, store, and ship the milk. Um, the majority of that milk is distributed from uh, the human milk bank to the NICU and then occasionally to home use as well. All right. So the process that they go through, obviously all the team members, they have to wash their hands very thoroughly. They ha always have to use gloves. They take the donated milk, they transfer it into another glass container. Um, it's usually pulled with about three to five other mom's milk. Um, it's thoroughly mixed up. Um, this is good because obviously it's kind of disseminating any, if there was anything bad in the milk, um, it's kind of diluting that out. Um, they pasteurize it. Um, afterwards, they actually culture it. Um, if there's any evidence of bacterial contamination, they discard it. Um, they then freeze it, store it, and then ship it. All right, so pasteurization, so they use holder pasteurization. Um, that's 62 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Um, it destroys, obviously, the cells, destroys some anti-inflammatory factors, viruses, and bacteria. And that's including good and bacteria. Um, uh, the bioactive components of human milk um, are also decreased, um, but it doesn't have as much of an effect on the macro and micronutrients like vitamins. All right. As of 2017, there were no reported cases of um, viral hepatitis or HIV from pasteurized donor milk, which is good. Um, so how about non-milk bank? breast milk. Um, I didn't realize, but this is actually a website that's out there. There are multiple other ones where you, you can actually go on and purchase or sell your breast milk. Um, and there's obviously no screening or pasteurization. Um, the milk is often from a single person, um, could be contaminated with medications or drugs. Um, there has been uh, reports of contamination with even human milk, or sorry, cow milk. Um, and it's definitely not recommended for all the things that we talked about. All right. So some final thoughts for you guys. Um, breastfeeding is not easy, but it's totally worth it. Um, it's great bonding experience with you and baby and you get benefits and baby gets benefits too. Um, breast milk is not sterile. Um, so you definitely need to take a lot of precautions in how you how you pump, how you store it, um, and how you um, clean everything. Um, and then again, for us, breastfeeding um, or feeding express milk is not recommended for moms that have HIV, Ebola, HTLV1 or 2, or untreated brucella. Some other thoughts? <laughs>
<laughs> don't cry over spilled milk unless it's breast milk and then cry a lot because <laughs> you went through a lot of effort to make it and get it out so um, some other thoughts wow. sorry <laughs> <laughs> be kind you never know how many times a mom got up last night <laughs> and here are all my references and photo credits no that is not me and my baby but I thought it was cute so any questions comments